A few weeks ago, Pat and Karen Schatzlein were here with us. And my wife was reading their book, Restore the Roar. And she came down the stairs and she said, we've got to have these people in our church. And she, she said, this, this word that's in this book is so incredible. These people are full of the kind of fire a word of life needs. And with, with all due respect, sir, I'd say, I've never heard of the Schatz lines before. And that, did, that doesn't mean I know everybody. But then I began to find out they preached with Pastor Marco down in Brazil, with Jim Pope in his church, with Pastor Chris Phillips, people that I'm in close, close relationship. And I just began to pick up the phone. I said, well, how do you think this anointing would fit with the word of life? I said, they're going to blow the roof off of your church is what's going to happen. So when they came in the last time, it wasn't just great sermons. It just wasn't, uh, no, no, no. It was, they were hearing from heaven. The man's been over here whispered in my ear, this is what God's saying to me. This is what God's showing me. This is what God's revealing. And so I got to get out of the way, but I've got to keep saying to you, fresh oil is being poured and new wine is being poured into you. And I believe if you get dialed in this morning, tonight, and tomorrow night, you're not going to leave here like you came in. You say, oh, you don't know how busy I am. You know, sometimes if you'd put God first, you might see a hundredfold increase in your business, in your career. If you just one time say, he's more important than this. He's more important than the soccer league. He's more important than this appointment. And reroute some things to say, God, I need a touch from heaven. I believe the Lord is going to move like you haven't seen him move in a long time. I want you to welcome our guest, God's man, evangelist, Pat Schatzlein. Let him know you're glad he's in the house. Lift your hands and begin to cry out to God. Lift your hands and begin to cry out to God if you would. Just cry out to him. Just cry out to him. You know, I can't get something out of my spirit. As Dr. Tim was sharing, I just felt so stirred in my spirit. Even different from last time. But I'm reminded of Psalm 78, verse 9. The men of Ephraim, though armed with bows, ready for battle, turned back and forgot the covenants. We are living in the day and age of people have been so churchified, so fat with the anointing, we have forgotten how to go deep again. And God is saying, I'm about to move in this room. I literally saw it a few minutes ago. I saw a, a wall go crashing down, and I said, Lord, what is that? And he said, it's the wall of separation that has been happening throughout our nation, throughout the land. And he reminded me of in Revelation that there's trees that line the roads of heaven that bear new fruit every single month. But the leaves for the healing are for the healing of the nations. And what God spoke to me was, he said, ask me to drop some leaves on the land. Because the Bible says, let it be on earth as it's done in heaven, as it is in heaven. You have to understand something. There's a shifting. Or let it be done in heaven as it is in earth. There's a shifting in the spirit where God, I just saw the Lord dropping leaves in the land. I know I sound crazy, and I am great with that. But I saw him say to me, those that have not been ready for battle, I'm about to bring back in. Those that have been wandering, I'm about to restore hope to. Those that have been separated from my presence because of a wall put there by the enemy, I'm about to bring home. I'm about to restore some things. And I just can't get out of my spirit. That old song, I just came to tell you, Lord, I love you. Are you with me so far? Just, just lift your hands. Lord, I love you. Lord, I love you. Come on, start telling him that. Oh, I just came to tell you, Lord. Lord, I love you. Lord, I love you. Tell him you love him out loud. Would you do that, church? Now, Father, in Jesus' name, over the next few minutes, 
I pray for the walls of separation that have kept us from entering into the next level with you to be knocked down. This house shall be full from balcony to floor. There will be miracles. It will rain glory. And I pray for the presence of God to overwhelm this house. Anybody that has been walking through anything, any deception of the enemy, Father, I pray that in Jesus' name you open their ears right now. You open their eyes to see a new season. This is a house that God has handpicked for such a time as this. It shall be greater in the latter than in the previous. And what God is about to do, in Jesus' name, we pray for a healing of hearts. Would you lift your hands and say one more time, Lord, I love you. Come on, louder than that. I don't know why. It's like God saying, tell them to tell me they love me. As you begin to do that, tell him, Lord, I love you. Lord, I love you. Father, I love you. Jesus, I love you. Tell him you love him. It's going to begin to break a crust off of your spirit. Say, Lord, I love you. Lord, I love you. Lord, I love you. Father, I love you. Dad, I love you. Come on, tell him. Oh, I just came to tell you that I love you. I want you to be seated across the house if you would. Now I've asked Chris to help me. So everyone else, thank you for your giftings and thank you. But you're going to help me, right? You ready? You're going to help me. So, so do me a favor. Would you, would you play just play an augmented chord for me? Just an augmented chord. Just a bold augmented. There we go. That's it. Just stick with it. Do, do it again for me. Just... Do it one more time. Man, that's right. You've got this. We're going to flow together. You didn't know it this morning when you woke up what I was going to ask you to do. You didn't know. But God has already prepared in your heart. Do it again. Do it again. And just, and, and, and let it end down there. Just stop between each one. Just stop. Just, there we go. Okay. Do, do it again. Okay, now we're getting it together. Do, do it one more time. I'm not being a showman. I'm trying to show you something. This is what the Holy Spirit is saying in the atmosphere. That we're about to step into something new. Do it again. All through the message, you're going to help me with that. In fact, you can, you can do it louder or softer. How many of you understand? I brought, I brought my caution tape with me today. Because we're going to leave some dead things in the pews. Are you ready for this this morning? And I've come to tell you that Holy Spirit is going to move in this room. Not just this morning, but tonight as well. And my beautiful lady is on her way here. Uh, okay, we're good. And so just, just be ready when, when I need you. Um, Karen is on her way here. She's getting on the flight right now. She was just in Pennsylvania where she, uh, at a Hershey Arena where they saw thousands of women come running to the altar. It was, I don't know if you have that picture up there. Just, uh, but show, show, I don't know, I don't know if you can see the one with the, with just thousands. But over the last couple of weeks, we've been seeing things we haven't seen in a number of years, just outpourings of the Holy Spirit. Wednesday night, I was at an old tent camp meeting. Anybody ever remember the old tent revivals? We literally had that uh, down in Mobile, Alabama. And over the last few weeks, we've seen these moves of the Spirit. There's that conference up there in the corner. But what I want to tell you is, I don't have anything on my calendar after today, after tomorrow. Because we're, we're closing out the year. And we're just like, let's just trust God. Let's just wait on God to see what he's going to do. And, and what I feel so strongly is tonight, tomorrow, are critical moves of the Spirit for your future. Anybody awake today? I feel now, listen, I'm about to share a message that I wrote recently, and so I don't know how long I'm going to go, so if I go real short, um, you'll, you'll say, look at God, amen. But if I go long, you'll say, won't he do it? But I've got to share this word to set up what is going to happen tonight because a week and a half ago, Holy Spirit gave me a message about when the prophetic is released. So I've asked Dr. Tim to flow with me tonight at the end to release a prophetic word over everyone in this house. Get your family, get your friends here, come prepared to see what God is going to do. Because we are moving into the season of the prophetic. I believe that with all my heart. But I want to say a couple things before I get into this because now this is my second time here. So that means I'm family. So that means I can get away with stuff. Amen. <laughs> I mean, you know, I put up with stuff from my kids. I mean, they got spanked and stuff. But anyway, but my, my grandkids, they do whatever they want. Here's what I want you to understand. I'm a part of the house today. 
Thank you. I trust these two. God placed them, and we're, we're going to be selfish about this. God placed these two in mine and Karen's life. And God has given you his very best. Now follow me for a second. And I'll go deeper into this tonight. But there are very few people I've ever met and instantly said, not I want to be friends with them. That's an obvious. But I want what they got. Because they carry an authority that is rare. They carry an authority that has been lost. They carry something that is so special. And I just want to say thank you for trusting Karen and I to come. Thank you for being generals, not just here, but around the land, all over America. People know these leaders. Would you give it up for your leaders? Come on, come, come, let's show honor. Let's show honor. Let's show honor. Let's show honor. Because honor rolls, open the, rolls out the red carpet. I show honor to them because of what they carry and the way they stand and the authority they walk in and the purity of heart they possess and the fact that they still pray and the fact that they still use God's word, the fact that they still go deep. Somebody give God a shout for that the fact that they haven't bought into microwave Christianity and they haven't bought into drive-by experiences the fact that they still believe we can come in and sit on a Sunday morning and go deep and not rush everyone out the door the fact that they'll still put extra dates on the calendar for the Holy Spirit to interrupt us so I'm gonna keep going for a second because this refreshes me and I don't want to have to go to Brazil to see that. And Karen and I travel all over the world. She's flying right now. She was in Pennsylvania yesterday. I was in Mobile. You have to understand, we don't go places where they're not hungry because we are done with that. But I believe not only is this the season of the prophetic, but we're about to see, see the season of supernatural physical healings. And so I'm asking God, I'm telling you, if you're sick, show up tonight. We're laying hands on you. We're going to break this thing, this demonic attack against the nations called COVID. I, I do want to tell you, if you have an opportunity, there is a, one thing I want to mention that's on the table. And I, and I don't do very well at this. I'm the worst at it. In fact, our board of directors tells me that. And, but uh, recently we wrote a, uh, a new book called The Glory Has Come. And it's an Advent devotional. It's 25 days to Christmas. And I wrote it with a, a number of leaders, um, uh, John Bevere and, and, and a bunch of others of us, uh, Daniel Kalenda, a bunch of, of friends of ours uh, came together and uh, put this together, uh, Tim Sheets, just a whole bunch. But I wrote a chapter in here on one of the days that I was asked to write about, the first altar call in the New Testament. And the very first altar call, when was it? It's when the angels appeared to the shepherds and said, hey, shepherds, go worship. Because God always tells the shepherds to worship first. So the first altar call of the New Testament was when the angels appeared and said, Shepherds, you're going to find him. Go and praise him. All through God's word, he always talks to shepherds first. Mom and dad, that's you. So if you do not have that book, I challenge you to grab it in the back. And, and walk with your family for 25 days leading up to Christmas. And I write in there about the fact that every Christmas Eve, I deliver to my family a prophetic scroll. I hand to my son, my daughter, my wife, uh, my in-laws, my dad. I give everyone a prophetic word because I go into hiding for a couple of days and I write out prophetic words. And it is crazy. This last Christmas Eve, I gave my son a prophetic word and I said, this is your year. You're going to step into the political realm. They will be saying your name in places you won't even, they won't even know who you are. That is happening. He's announcing in two weeks his run for Congress. And so you have to understand... The state rep of Congress. But what you have to realize is all of this stuff is happening. But it all starts with the gatekeepers of the house. The gatekeeper that says, we're not accepting a spirit of perversion because if I accept it, it will overtake my child. That means when they come home and they go, mom and dad, culture's telling me I'm supposed to look like this and I was born wrong. You look at them and you say, I rebuke that demonic spirit and tell it it cannot have access in my house. And moms and dads, when you rebuke that spirit, it will not take over. But if you say, I accept it because I love you and you don't give the word of God to it, it will literally in 24 hours change the identity of that child. I'm not going into that today. 
But what I am calling, the reason why I'm mentioning the glory has come is because it is time for gatekeepers to arise like never before. That'll say, not my house, not my family. Can I, uh, play, play that for me real quick. Just play it. Just. See, I've got to share a message that is prophetic for what God is saying because something new is about to break out. Not everyone will be a part of it because we're living in the day and age where the sheep and the goats are being separated and a goat will eat anything. We're living in a day and age where grace is being preached without accountability, without responsibility, even though grace is the most beautiful word I know. Because I couldn't earn it. And it empowers me to live a godly life, not to do whatever I want. So as I move into this, and you know Karen and I wrote uh, Restore the Roar right before COVID hit, the power and breath of God defeating the spirit of fear. We had no idea it was coming to America. But if you'll allow me, I've got to share a different type of message because I feel like, uh, I guess the only way to describe it would be over in, in, in um, let me get into this. When all of a sudden Mary felt the baby leap in her womb. That's what I feel in my spirit. There's a stirring, a leaping, like something is about to happen. It's the Isaiah 43, 18, streams in the desert. It's Revelation chapter 3, that wake up, strengthen what remains. I have not found your deeds complete in my sight. So if you don't care this morning, I've got to preach a message called don't ask me for that. Because God is trying to separate some of you from some things. And this word was birthed in my... Play, play that for me. They, they, I don't want them to get sleepy. I feel in my spirit that we're at the beginning of something in this church. I don't just show up for another date on the calendar. I promise you, I don't need that. In fact, people are calling our office to schedule us. And I'm going, no, 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 no. Only covenant. Tell my office, we're only going to covenant. I'm not just doing another date on the calendar. I was supposed to be in Rhode Island a couple weeks ago. I said, I can't go there. There's no covenant there. I'm only going to places that are hungry. Is anybody hungry this morning? Give God a praise offering. I'm being honest. That sounds almost arrogant, but it's not meant that way. I've flown three million miles around the world, preached on six continents, and I am done with travel dates. I want to go where he's about to move. I want to go even if they can't see it. I want to go when they don't understand what is coming. I want them to begin to get to that place where they say, Behold, I am doing a new thing. Give God a praise. Play, play that note. Only play that note. No, don't walk with me. Walk with me tonight, but just play that note. Chris trying to get out of hand over here. If he wasn't big, he'd be. Grab, grab your Bibles. Grab your Bibles. I got to get into this this morning because I feel so stirred about this. Look in your Bibles at Luke, the 17th chapter. Now, I'm going to read a long scripture, so you're going to have to bear with me because it takes us on a journey. In fact, go ahead and stand up for this, for the reading of God's Word. Luke, chapter 17, we're going to look at verse 32. We're going to look there, and it's going to go long, and you just have to just have patience with me. Looking at Luke, chapter 17, looking at verse 32, this is what the scripture says. Uh, it says, remember Lot's wife! Exclamation point. You may be seated. What's long to some is short to others. <laughs> Let me set this scene for you. Because this scripture bothers me. Because when you look at this scripture, Jesus gives an exclamation point at the end of it. And I'm going to get to the rest of the scripture in a few moments. But he does something here that is, I brought my caution tape. Anybody raised in a neighborhood that saw a lot of caution tape? But for some reason, Jesus is sharing. This, this is red letter stuff right here. He's sharing, and all of a sudden, he interrupts his diatribe to those disciples, and he stops, and he says, remember Lot's wife. In fact, you're going to see it. He amps up. How many of you did your mother ever start out softly but end up loud? 
Clean your room. Clean your room. Boy, you better get your tail up there and clean that room. This is what Jesus does right here. He amps up. He's a brilliant communicator. He never said a single syllable without a meaning tied to it. And every time he would do it, many times he would make it Old Testament centered. That's called Christo-centered. And we're living in a day and age where recently a guy that I know of just preached that we don't need the Old Testament. Has he lost his ever-loving mind? Because you cannot have the New Testament without the Old Testament. Are you following me? And Jesus deliberately would refer back to things. So he refers back to Genesis 19 and he refers back to a no-name woman. She's not a woman of... of of bad reputation. She's not a woman of, of good reputation. She's not important. She doesn't add to anything. In fact, she sits on your table next to the pepper. In fact, she's no name. She's not a Rahab. She's not a Mary. She's not a Sarah who judged God faithful. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is Hebrews 11, 11, 11. Sarah judged God faithful. The only time you find God judged in the Bible is when he's judged faithful. You should start your prayer every morning with, I judge you faithful. That's one of his very names. But all of a sudden, Jesus interrupts. And he says, remember Lot's wife. And I'm going to come back to it in a moment. But I don't get it because she's not important. She doesn't even have a name. So we're going to give her a name. We're going to name her Lottie. Y'all remember that song? Hey, Lottie, Lottie. Yeah, okay. I'm the only redneck in the room. Follow me. I got to set the scene, though, because I'm preaching. Don't ask me for that. Don't, don't ask me for that. Don't ask me to go to another level. Don't ask me to interrupt my calendar on a Sunday night and a Monday night. Don't ask me for that. I don't know if the Broncos will be done playing by then. Don't ask me for that. Don't ask me to dive back into this thing because I got hurt at my last church. I got, I, I had something happen and I feel a lot like Paul when he shipwrecked on the island of Malta. I, I, I survived the shipwreck and then I went to the next church and I started serving and while serving I got bit by a snake and now because I got bit by a snake if I don't learn how to shake that thing off into the fire I take on a murdering spirit and I harm everybody that comes to don't ask me for that don't ask me to be different we're living in the day and age where woke culture will cancel you and they'll confuse every word you say in a day and age when you say you believe in the life of the unborn. It was recently voted on the, on the floor of Congress that you can kill a baby after it's born. That, that evening, a congresswoman that stood up and argued against that flew to Fort Worth and came to our home that night and, held, and, and told us about the child she held up saying, how in the world could we kill this right here? This is what I miscarried. And what's wrong with you people? But, but we have a day and age where preachers are afraid to speak about that stuff because somebody might cancel me. I might, might, it might hurt our finances. Can I tell you something? The only good thing that has come out of that demonic attack called COVID is it has shut down the voice of the woke preachers that weren't in the prayer closet. And when this thing hit, they had nothing to say. And all of a sudden, they were like, ah, well, my fluffy little sermons don't work anymore. What do I say? So they just ended up on the balcony of boredom like David or in the lap of, uh, of, of Delilah like Samson. But what has happened, and I'm seeing it happen right now, God is slowly muting their voice. Voices, shutting those down that won't stand for truth and he's a re-raising up the voices of the mothers and the fathers in the generation that have something to say something somebody help me preach because I'm I'm gonna get into this for a second I'm preaching about don't ask me for that don't ask me to change I know you want to play the Chris Chris trying to get loose up here hold on Chris just play up just play the note for me you felt that it hit you? Uh, there we go. Just. All right. Chris is flowing with me sometimes. Hold on. <laughs> but church, I'm going to say something sobering, and I feel that the calamity is upon our nation. 
And soon we'll, we'll be, we will be able to hear the scratching at the sound of the door like Noah. And when I began to write this message, it was right before, it was just a couple of months ago, it was right before we sold a, a property that we were living in, a ranch that we had rebuilt. And man, I'm telling you, something would go wrong every day on this property. It's 14 acres. I mean, something would break. I, I bought more tools during the season of rebuilding this old ranch, more things. And, and I woke up and I was writing and working on this message because God spoke it to me. And I could hear water, could hear water. And leaking, and I'm like, are, are you kidding me? Has another pipe broke? We, I mean, all this different kind of stuff. And I went around the house, and the Lord said, what you hear is the sound of the flood. For those that are hungry for God, it will be the river of the Spirit. For those that are not, will be drowned by the things of the enemy. And I feel this so strongly in my spirit, what God is about to do. In a day and age where, and this is a message for the cave dwellers. This isn't no, for normal church people. This is for the ones that have been saying, God, I, ha I have to have a word. I'm the one that's telling my family we're going to be all right. I'm the one that's speaking faith over them. But they're just getting harder of heart, harder of heart every time I talk to them. This is for the ones that are saying, I need more. Is anybody hungry? And we're living in a day and age where we're afraid to share what we really believe. And if we're afraid, afraid to share our convictions, then culture will determine the fact that we are irrelevant. And you have to understand it is the season of the roar. I shared this when I was here with you recently. That the year when, when we wrote this was 5780. It was two years ago in the Hebrew calendar. And that means to sh uh, the number 80 means to pray, shout, roar, P-E-Y. But now also we've moved into 5781, which was just in. And it means to bear your teeth. But now we're in, in 5782. Uh, and it literally means to the mouth uh, uh, and the sun coming together. It means when we speak, it's a declaration over your house. That is the Jewish year we're in right now. So you have to realize it's what we wrote in our book, Restore the Roar. Amos 3.8, as the lion roars, the prophet speaks. God is restoring the roar so that the prophetic voices can come forth again. So I must get into this. But before I can go any deeper into what I've got to share about don't ask me for that and don't ask me for that God I've got to establish if you don't mind a little bit of kingdom identity because this isn't taught on very often I'm sure it is here but a lot of people don't understand kingdom identity and you won't be able to receive this message if you're still sitting at the wrong table you must understand I have spent my life since 16 years old and I'm 52 hearing the whisper of God Many times when he gives me a prophetic word, I'll hear it in three persons. I'll hear it in the authority of the Father first. Then I'll hear it in the love of the Son. And then I'll hear it in the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. At the moment I feel it in the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, I will speak that prophetic word over someone and it will be released. Now prophecy's not fixed, it's formed. So in other words, someone walked up to you when you were 17 and said, you're going to touch the nations. You're anointed, but you went out into the world. That prophecy was put on hold because you did not walk in obedience. There's two parts that flow with that. But what I have learned is God speaks to me. He speaks via the whisper. It's Matthew 10, 27. This will be on my tombstone. This, will literally, this is my life verse. It, it says, what I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ears, proclaim from the roof. Play, play that for me real quick, Chris, if you don't mind. So as I'm establishing this message, and I'm preaching, don't ask me for that. Don't ask me to give that up. Don't ask me to give up the offense. Don't ask me to go to another level. And I'm going to come back to remember Lot's wife. I promise I'll tie it all together. But what you have to understand, your identity as a believer will never be found in the circle of the saved. Now, we must come together. We must lock arms. But your true identity comes from sitting at the table with the king. Having that daily prayer time, that walk. And all through my life, I have listened for the whisper. I don't care if it's in, in uh, our ministry, in my health, when he told me to take back my health, in our health coaching business, helping people. He speaks to me in every aspect. Every book we've written, he speaks to me. When we wrote The Glory Has Come, and they said, would you be one of the authors in it? And God, I said, Lord, what do you want me to share? He said, tell them about the first altar call. Okay, Lord. And that's the way I live my life. 
it's all about the whisper. But there's a season where the whisper eventually turns into a roar. I'm going there. Are you still with me? What made John the Revelator so special is he understood Coram Deo. What is Coram Deo? It's a Latin term, and it means fullness of Christianity. But basically, it means head, heart, feet. When you understand Coram Deo, it's what happened with John the Revelator. Remember when John laid his head on the chest of Jesus? He understood how to hear the whisper. He was close enough with one ear to the heartbeat, the other ear to hear the whisper. And, but he had already had the head part, so he'd had, he had already been called. Then he had the heart part. He could hear the whisper. Then by the time we get to Revelation, he's at his feet. He said, I fell as a dead man. It's an understanding of what true Christian walk is. It's I'm a part of the kingdom. It's the reason why John was called the beloved because he got it. I have to do something with my feet. I have to do something with my heart. I have to do something with my head. I can't stay in the same place all the time. I've got to be going somewhere for God. Give him a praise offering. I'm trying to take you on a come on, praise him. But what starts as a whisper should lead to a revelation. See, I have learned that God always starts softly with you. He will isolate you. The greater the anointing, the greater the isolation. Nobody ever prophesies over the quiet days. But it's in those days that you learn how to be a part of what he is doing. And God is calling some of you to actually get your prayer life back. If you're only getting fed on Sunday, it reminds me of, of um, Hebrews 5, uh, which I believe Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul wrote Hebrews. It's a, it's a personal thing, I believe, because there's comparison scriptures, because all you got to do is go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, or 1 Corinthians chapter 5, I believe it is, and where it says, by now you ought to be. You ought to be teaching, but you're still a student. You ought to be eating meat, but you're still drinking milk. You know what milk is? Milk is something digested by somebody else. And we've got a lot of milk Christians. So in other words, it's about understanding that when you come to church on Sunday, you'll get the meat of the word, you'll get the milk, but in your prayer life, you got to get more. If you only eat on Sunday, you're going to waste away. You're still with me, right? So it's an understanding that you're called to go deeper. It shouldn't be a shock when pastor says, hey, we're going to have a service on Sunday night and Monday night. Something you ought to go, instead of dread, like, oh, man, I got my schedule. I got all this stuff because we busied our way out of, out of having encounters in America. And, and instead, something goes off in your spirit because you've been in your prayer closet like, this is the moment I have been waiting on. This is what I've been praying about. Something new is going to happen. I'm not missing this thing. I'm not staying at home. Because everything on TV is stupid. But it's Matthew chapter 6, and I love the version it's written in. Karen actually showed me this one morning. I, I love this. And, and here's what I want you to do. Find a quiet, secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play before God. Just be there as simply and honestly as you can. Manage. The focus will shift from you to God, and you'll begin to sense his grace. In other words, when you go into your prayer closet, and you got all your complaining going on, and when, when you're in there, after a few minutes, God says, are you done? Because I want to talk to you. And the grace of God begins to overwhelm you. Play that for me. See, I have to establish this before I can preach this because I'm about to ask you to sacrifice. I'm about to ask you to go to another level. And what you do, you begin to understand it's in isolation that God removes your voice for his voice. He starts talking to you. It's where he begins to shift you. It's where God begins to remove those voices that have held you back. Some of you, honestly, how much are you spending time with him? It's where your identity as a child comes. It's Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6 that we're seated in heavenly places with him. And if you've not been seated beside him, you'll be sitting at the wrong table. And if, as long as the issue of paternity is still at stake, you'll still show up and sit at the wrong table. You'll show up at work and sit with people you ain't supposed to sit with because they like to talk to you about how you used to be. And God's whispering, but here's who you are. Behold, you're new. 
Here's what I'm calling you to. Do you not realize this is your mission field? And while you're complaining for God to bring you another job until your assignment is complete, he will never make that happen. He'll never move on the part of that boss to give you that elevation. You know why? Because he's trying to get you to make a shift and make a change in somebody. And as long as you're sitting at tables where you feel insecure or unworthy, listen, never embrace the spirit of unworthiness as a king's child. You are a mobile upper room. When you walk into places, demons ought to be diving out windows. And when God said to me, you're going to preach this this morning, and I said, okay, Lord, you want me to talk to them about this? He said, tell them over the next couple of days, I'm trying to change their DNA. And we're living in a day and age where we'd rather listen to Dr. Fauci than Father God. Now, don't get me wrong. That disease is real. But I still believe in Psalms 91. No height, no calamity, no sickness, nothing shall touch me. Yes, it can attack my body, but it cannot have me. And if it does take me out, I'll be in glory. And to be absent from the body is to be with him. I don't lose. I'm so amazed. I see people driving down the road with a mask on and nobody else is in the car. I just start singing, this is the air I breathe. I'm sorry. But what if we walked in this room and from the moment we got out of our car, we declared this a sanitized zone. Sanitized zone where sanity is involved and where we can walk in here and we can say, you know what? I'm going to tell you the truth. He knows my time clock on earth. He pushes everything away. He can still breathe upon a disease. I have a wife that was healed of leukemia. Don't you talk to me about a God that doesn't heal because I know what I saw happen. I saw a DNA shift. I saw, I know what happened three years ago on an Easter morning and when a young lady beautiful African American little girl comes mama brings her up she's completely deaf on Easter and all of a sudden she comes up to me the mama did and she said she said we just we just got her she just came into our home and we just found out this week she's completely deaf and I said no 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 and Karen and I reached out and said we Bind that demonic thing that's over her ears. Her ears instantly open. Her mama came and saw me Wednesday night in Mobile, Alabama and showed me a picture and said she is still healed and now she is ours. <laughs> You're a king's child. Do you know who you are? And he's about to ask you for more. He's about to ask you to come into this thing. It's Romans 8 verse 16. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. You are the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5 21. You represent who he is. And when you catch a glimpse of the Father, honestly self-reflection is the mirror uh, where, where you can look at yourself and not like it. But if you catch a glimpse of who's in you, you suddenly realize I'm not as bad as I thought because objects in the mirror are closer than they appear I'm not where I used to be and people like to judge me for uh, where I used to be but all they saw was a splotch on the canvas but when he gets done for me got done with me it's gonna be a masterpiece that most beautiful picture to go in a museum give him a praise and help me preach for a second Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. He didn't say, come to me, who have, all have got a big ministry, all who've got a big following on social media. I'm telling you, none of that junk matters. But there are times when he goes from the secret whisper to the shout. Where he says, I've been waiting to use you. I've been wanting to use you in a powerful way. And what the Lord told me to come and tell you is come out. The battle has begun for the souls of this nation. Can God count on this house to be a flagship, a standard bearer? Or are we just going to jump from political election to political election and act like that? It controls our destiny. Where it's about donkeys and elephants and not lambs. Can we get over that junk? They've been dividing us since the beginning of our nation. They got it from Europe and brought it here. 
And if you don't know what that's about, go watch Parliament in Europe. They're still doing it there. You can watch it on TV sometimes. I do, just because I think it's funny. And I hope that you hid away long enough because now is your moment. Some of you are going to feel the tap of the Holy Spirit on your shoulders over the next few minutes. I hope I get through this word, but i got to hurry. You'll have to stay with me for a minute longer because I feel like Holy Spirit is walking up behind people. Chris, play that for me. And he's doing this to him. He's talking to you. I've been trying to get you ready. Some of you trying to retire and God ain't done with you yet. Some of you trying to just enjoy the back life and sit down. I put my time in. I got my pension. And God is saying, don't you realize I didn't even anoint Moses, I didn't even awaken Moses till she till he was 80. Don't you realize Joshua didn't take the reins till he was nearly the same age? Don't you realize I'm looking for those that will rise up? I brought my caution tape with me. Give him a praise offering. And leaders, listen to me, humanity is crying out for leaders who know the voice of God and not just the echoes of ministry textbooks. I wrote this down. Taught this part of my new book, taught by many who have never once scraped their knees on the floor of brokenness as vessels that houses God's spirit. We must be last in line of recognition and first in line for revelation. All over this room, would you begin to pray in the Holy Spirit because God wants to do something? He told me to play that note for me. There's a shifting in the atmosphere where he says, I'm trying to tell you something, but first you got to be all okay if he asks you for that. Isolated Christians hiding from an infected culture will only hoard the antidote called hope. And we are in the quietest hour of the church in generations right now. Much like Esther, we were hidden away for a year. I hope you were ready to meet with the king. And write this down. The wave is coming. Several years ago, I went to bed one night, and all of a sudden, I had a dream. And in the dream, I was running across a giant map of America, and Karen was running right beside me. But we were running, and I looked back, and there's a giant wave coming. A tsunami. And I'm running, and I'm running, and I'm screaming as I'm running across a map of the United States. I'm screaming, come on, get to safety. And somehow I ended up in the Northeast. I ended up in Washington, D.C. in the dream at the portico of the White House, and I put my arms around the port post, and the wave hit. I wrote about it in my book, Unqualified, that there's a wave coming, that God would raise up the most unqualified in the last days. Karen had the same dream and wrote it in her journal. I was on television with Daystar TV with uh, Marcus Lamb, and I'm sharing about the wave that is coming. And Marcus and I that afternoon went to spend some time together, and Marcus says, you are not going to believe this, how my phone is being blown up from our our TV station there in Dallas, in Grapevine, he said, everyone that is calling in saying they had the same dream. I've asked the Lord many times, what is the dream? And he said, it's two part. Glory and destruction. So I have to tell you, the wave is coming. And those that are ready will be a part of the greatest move of God you've ever seen. But let's go back to that verse for a second. In Luke chapter 17. Let me bring that verse up for you. If you would bring that up. I, I want to back up for a second. As it was in the days of Noah, so also will be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating and drinking, marrying and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. Now it goes on to say in verse 28. And we're going to go there in just a second. Because uh, you have to understand. This is, this is a scripture that scared me to death as a child. I thought the rapture was going to happen every night. How many of you ever thought you missed the rapture? We could like join a, we could join a club. I'm telling you. I came home from school so many times. And nobody was at home. And I'm like. <laughs> it's over. They're going to chop my head off. 
My parents made, my dad was the head of, was one of the heads of Team Challenge and made us watch with every new class, Thief in the Night. <laughs> I'm telling you, that'll mark a kid. It messed me up. I still think I missed it. And sometimes I'll get home and I'll go, Karen, Karen. And she'll walk around the corner. Do you think you missed it? <laughs> she ain't right. <laughs> now watch what it says right here. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. Play that for me real quick. It will be just like this on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, no one who is on the housetop with possessions inside should go down to them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for them. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to keep their life will, will, will lose it. Whoever loses their life will preserve it. It goes on to say, I tell you on that night, two people will be in the one bed. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding grain together. One will be taken and the other left. Where, Lord? They ask. He replied, where there is dead vulture, where there is a dead body, the vultures will gather. You have to understand, I'm not going to go into the vulture part of it, but it's mentioned several times in God's word. And it is always when you're buying into demonic lies. Always. Cognitive dissonance. You hear culture saying something so much, when one and a half percent of culture is actually guiding America's culture. You've heard it so much, it's got to be scientifically proven that it's right, it's wrong. When the transgender spirit that is being released in our nation and the church won't say anything about it because we don't want to get anybody upset. Can I tell you something? It is a fist in the face of God and what he created. And my God doesn't make mistakes. But it is coming for your children to bring forth confusion. To kill the first promise in the Bible. The first command. Go and prosper. Go and propagate. And so in other words, the enemy is trying to interrupt. Because every time God wants to change a generation, somebody gives birth. So what he's doing is he is creating a mindset that identity is something you can decide and not something that God puts upon you. And that is a lie that is being bought into culture. And I don't want to say anything because I might, might, might upset my cousin. I might upset my niece. You know, let me tell you something. You better say something because gatekeeper, you better rise up and say, I love you, honey. And this does not make me stop loving you. But I love you so much, I'm going to tell you the truth even if you hate me. And the truth is God doesn't do that. And let me show you through the word. Somebody help me preach for a second. It's like half of you believe it. Well, I'm going to tell you, the half that don't believe what I just said, you're a problem. You're a problem. Because you're going contrary to God's word if that is you. And if I offend anybody, I'm not meaning it in a hateful way. I have spoken to 2 million teenagers, over 400 youth camps, over 100 big conferences on continent to continent, from Hillsong to Singapore to New Zealand. And I can tell you, I have never seen a young person that gets filled with the Spirit still battle with the lies of the enemy. So there's a moment where we got to reach in, pull the junk out, fill them back up, and say, you're going to be filled up with His glory. I'm going to pray in tongues with you. We're going to break these lies off of you. You weren't born that way. You are so precious in the sight of my God. You are a child of the King. Somebody help me. But don't ask me for that. Play that. Don't ask me for that. And the greatest battle is not what's going on out in the world, but it's what's happening in the church. We've gone quiet when we should be loud. We're so worried about what everyone thinks. Listen, I'm not even worried about religious killers of revival, those that are supposed to be on the same team that fire, fire friendly, friendly fire at us. I get that all the time. It's happened to me many a times. But you have to understand, they, the ones that God will no longer use are the ones that will dismiss the Holy Spirit and put him off in some youth room or some once-a-year retreat encounter and no longer allow God to move in the middle of a sanctuary when we come together and lock arms. And I wrote this down the other day, and I want to, I want to read this quote to you because I should have been a rapper. Now watch this. Can I just say this? I am done. Chris, get excited with me. Play it one time. Just one. I am done with going to pretty. Got it all together. Perfect song list. Spot. I wrote this on a plane after a rough Sunday, so just take it. Got it all together. Perfect song list. Spot on cues. I had preached six times on a Sunday, and I just sat on a plane going, oh, kill me. 
Spot on cues, microwave services that couldn't heat popcorn. Sunday best, uh, best, Monday less. Used to cry out, got to get out. Got professional, chairs full, move them in. Uh, get, move them through, rather. Next round of seekers at the door. Preach no conviction, even less consecration. Lost spirit of insurrection has forgotten the resurrection. Duty done, Sunday's over, let's have fun. Lost purpose and proposed rehearsals. I wrote that sitting on a plane. Sent it to my staff and said, this is how I feel. Let's not talk today. <laughs> this is the hour of not got it together. Don't care what you look like when you come in. This is the hour where God's going to bring in the ones that you would have never handpicked to be on your team. But they're going to walk in. And because redemption has hit them, they've been purchased with blood. Something about them. They're going to rise up and they're going to lead. Can you, can you get a hold of this? So I'll bring this to a, a steady close. Preaching, don't ask me for that. Write that down. Don't ask me for that. God's will is always in direct contrast to the ways of man. This has been the battle since the garden. Because submitting to God, and here's the key, always requires trust and not lean. Lean not to your own understanding. Trust the Lord with your, all your heart. That's why it says in 1 John 2 verse 17, this world and its desires are in the process of passing away, but those who loved to do the will of God live forever. But see, sometimes God will ask you for things that you didn't see it coming. He'll ask you for things. He'll walk up to you and say things that he don't even think, you don't even think he's noticed. Like, drop your nets. But this is how I feed my family. Oh, I know, but I'm going to make you fishers of men. He'll ask you for things that you don't think really bothers him. So don't ask me for that. He'll literally say things. He'll, he'll ask you for what you thought would sustain you. Hey, do me a favor. What you doing with a woman? Bake me a cake. Are, have you lost your ever-loving mind? I'm going to feed myself and my son. No, if you'll bake me a cake and use your last for me and give your last to me, I can reproduce it and you'll never be hungry. He'll ask you for things that are out of the, it's just peculiar. He'll even try to pull you out of what you believed you had to have in order to be successful, rich young ruler. See, the problem isn't that he was rich. God has no problem with blessing. He takes joy in our prosperity, gives the ability to create wealth. You have to understand he loves to bless you, and I, I am strongly believe that with everything inside of me. The problem is if it's your idol. It's Matthew 19. He said, Jesus said to him, if you want to be complete, go sell everything. Why would he tell that guy that? Because it was his idol. He'll even ask you to change your way of thinking. No, don't ask me. to. Now, mama, mama voted like that. Daddy voted like that. Don't ask me to give that up. Can I tell you something? He'll ask you to do things that will, and he'll say, but you're being like the world. But Romans 12 says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He'll ask you to change your way of thinking. See, God doesn't ask you to do something unless he knows there's a reward on the other side. He's a good father. He's asking you to do it here. you got to break that thing off. You don't need to be involved with that person. But God, it's, it, it's all I got. No, trust me. I'll move that. If you'll move that out of the way, I can give you what's waiting on you over here. Something better, but you got to trust me and not lean to your own understanding. There's something greater on the other side of your obedience. And when he asks you for something, it's because he sees the future. He knows what, there's a reason why he was crucified between two thieves, yesterday and tomorrow. They'll both try to steal from you, but if you keep him in your today, you're going to be just fine. So you have to realize, oh, I'm about to wrap up. It's Luke chapter 17, verse 30. It goes on to say, because he asked for this, watch this. He says, it will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, no one who is on the housetop with possessions inside should go down to get them. Like nice, no one in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to keep their life will lose it. And Jesus is using Sodom and Gomorrah as an example here. He's actually not confronting the spirit of homosexuality. He's confronting a mindset. 
It goes on to say in verse 31. I'm reading it to you again. On that day, no one who is on the housetop with possessions should go down to get them. So we have an image. Jesus is the master storyteller. The image of calamity striking. The, the return of Christ. We've got all this stuff happening in this incredible prose that he's sharing in this powerful story. And he says, oh, by the way, the images of a man on the roof Calamity is striking. Jesus is coming. Things are about to happen. And the man, he tells the man, don't go back downstairs. But my stuff's in the house. And the person on the roof, and this is what I've come prophetically to tell this house. This is what God sent me here to share this morning. The person on the roof has a immediate decision. Do I leave this service and go back to the way I've been, where I have gossip for lunch, where I sit with the same people? I'm kind of a Sunday morning compromiser, uh, and, 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 you know, I do whatever I want, got my feel, treating him like Catholic Pentecostals. Play that note for me real quick. Just play that note. I'm about to wrap up here in a second, but don't anybody else play yet. Here's what I want to get across for you. To you and all of it, but I need to go back down to the house, Pat. I gotta fix some things. I gotta, I gotta make some relationships right. I gotta go visit a grave. My daddy's ashes are on the mantle, and you have a choice. Do I go back down there or do I stay up here in the move of God? Do I keep going back to yesterday, which can't feed my today? Do I keep diving back into the old way, or do I suddenly make I wish somebody to help me preach for a second? And somebody, you need to understand this you got to leave this stuff in the house. i got to go get the house clean. No. And the problem is a lot of us don't know how to just let it go. And God is saying that the story right here that he's preaching or that he's sharing is simply don't go back. This is what God sent me to tell you, church. Don't go back. Don't get, go back. Don't go back. God is saying it's time to rise up. And and the reason why I've had, play that note for me, just that note. A little bit louder. In fact, just do that. That's called an augmented cord. What is an augmented cord? It, hold on just a second. It's the beginning of something. It's once you get through the intro of the music, it's almost now it's time to sing. I hear this in the spirit over this house. And the reason why I've had him do that is God's been trying to do that to you. He's been allowing the augmented cord to arise in your spirit. And I've got to, I've got to close this out. But this is what the Lord said. We established kingdom identity. You're on the roof. God's about to do something. He's about to move. And it is said that when young Mozart was was working one night. He was writing a concerto, young Mozart. And as he's writing the concerto, he ends on an augmented note. Just boom, just once, just once. Don't, there you go. Just stop it right there. He ends on. So he goes upstairs. He gets his jammies on. He goes to get in bed. But all he can hear is. Every time he tries to go to sleep, he's in the middle of writing this concerto, and he had stopped at the point of when you're supposed to start. And so as he's laying there in bed, he's tossing and he's turning and he's tossing and he's turning, but he keeps hearing. Do it again. So finally, he gets up out of bed and goes down and, write and finishes writing the concerto. What am I trying to say to you? Why am I having him do that? Because in the spirit, this is what God is saying. God is saying there's a moment where you have to go and not worry about anything else. He's saying, I'm trying to do something new in this place. I'm about done right here. I'm trying to tell this house, it doesn't matter what I used to do here. It doesn't matter who used to come here. I'm doing something right now. Keep doing it. I'm doing something right now that's bigger than you. I'm doing something right now that's more powerful than you. I'm doing something right now that has nothing to do with yesterday's pruning or yesterday's fruit. I'm trying to do something in this church and we're still having to talk you into coming in and God God is saying, if you're watching by internet, get up, get ready. I'm about to do something in you. And he's calling the house of God back to the place. But he's saying, this time, get on the roof. 
but I need to go down to get on the roof. But my family don't like me going there. Get on the roof. But I've got to go down and try to get on the roof. I'm done. But I got all this stuff in this house. Stand with me. Forgetting what is behind. Forgetting. The rain's coming. The flood is coming. I'm going to prophesy something to you. You're about to see massive moral failure in churches. Not that moral failure wasn't already there. I'm talking about leadership. Thank you for being pure. Thank you for traveling correctly. Thank you for guarding your marriage. The Lord has kept you young because he cannot allow you to age. I'm telling you what, uh, listen, don't, don't clap. I just heard the Lord say this. He said, tell him, go ahead, you're, you're soft. The Lord said, I'm keeping them young. Because many of your contemporaries are done. There's a lot of hanging empty jackets and closets. But the Lord won't allow you to get, get old. I mean, your hair, I'm, I'm just mad about that, but we'll, we'll deal with that later. But I'm telling you, I heard the Lord say, I'm keeping him young because I cannot allow him to age. Because there's very few generals left in this nation. We don't have a changing of the guard. There's no one there to take the guard spot. And the reason why I'm sharing this, are you willing to leave the stuff behind? Stuff that doesn't serve the anointing on your life. Stuff you started binge watching in the middle of COVID and at first you're like, we need to turn that off. And now you're like, can't wait to watch it. Stuff that has interrupted your calling. You got so caught up in the election, you're still angry. Oh, come on, man. I get it. If your guy won or your guy, I don't care. It's not about that. Anyone that's ever ran for office eventually dies. But let me tell you who doesn't a king, a king of glory. A king that this still says, blessed is the nation whose God is their God. I don't think he's done with America. I'm a missionary to America. People try to get me to go over overseas all the time. And I can't because I'm called to America. I'm called here. In fact, I'll just say it. It's time for the missionaries to come home. <laughs> Not all, obviously. But we need them back in America. Bring that same fervor, fervor to our streets. The same faith you have to live in a very dark place, in a dangerous place, you need it here. And God is saying, remember Lot's wife. Why did he throw this woman in? I don't understand it. Verse 32. What was Jesus trying to say? You have to know the story of Lot. Lot was one of them hanger honors. Lot was one of those people that never did anything on his own. He followed Abraham. He always was tagging on along with everybody. And when she married Lot, she married his disease. Because what you marry, you put your same luggage in the U-Haul. Next thing you know, she's living a life as a nomad. She is so upset about it. Till finally they move into this really new house, really cool housing development called Sodom and Gomorrah. And it's beautiful. It's perverted. But don't tell her that because she finally got a place of her own. She finally got her comfort zone. She finally got the American dream. And all of a sudden, now forget the fact that uh, when visitors come to the house, the men want to rape them. 
Forget the fact that God has had, Abraham has interceded and sent angels uh, that, that just, you know, to come and warn them and get them out. God's about to destroy the place with hell, hell, fire, hell and fire and brimstone. And, and forget all that. This is my comfort zone, Pat. I don't want you to mess with my comfort zone. I'm, re I'm retiring from the post office in three years. Don't make me uncomfortable and tell me, you know, what I'm talking about. Don't, don't mess with my comfort zone. I'm, I'm finally relaxing. And all of a sudden, uh, about that time, the angels come and say, we got to get you out of here. Oh, no, you don't. Uh-uh. You shut up, Lot. Forget the fact that Lot was negotiating the rape of his daughters. Forget all that. That's just, that's just weird. That's just white noise. And the angel comes and says, you got to get out and you got to run. And you can't look back. Genesis 19. So when Jesus is talking about what is coming, which I believe we're moving into that day, the disciples think it's about to happen right then. But Jesus is talking about coming uh, upon this day. And he says, it's going to happen. It's going to happen in the twinkling of an eye. It's going to be like lightning. Get on the roof. Be ready. Leave all your junk, all your baggage down there. And he interrupts the middle of it with said, remember Lot's wife. The reason is, is when they grabbed Lottie and start dragging her out of the city and running to freedom. And there is literally the heavens are opening up. Hellfire and brimstone is about to come down. And all of a sudden, we know what it says in Genesis chapter 9. 19. All of a sudden they said run towards the hills and they said but don't look back. Can't look back. I won't go back. I can't be a part of yesterday's junk. At the moment you look back you're giving your heart back to yesterday. You're giving your heart back to the thing that used to own you. And all the angels said you got one command. You're going to get free and you're going to move on but don't look back. And as she's running she turns around to say goodbye to Happy Valley for just a second. And if she does she freezes and becomes a monument and not a movement. And for too long, the churches look back. Look back who used to be here, who used to sit right here and broke everybody's heart, who used to be a part of the house. And God says, enough. I am calling this out. Come here. Come here. Come here, sweetheart. Yep. Hold this for me right there. All right. This is what God told me to do today. Here, 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 here. Come stand right here. Just hold that. Hold it tight. Right there. There we go. All right. All right. Come here, woman of God. Come here. Hold it tight. No, this part right here. There we go. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Grab it for me. Go ahead and grab a piece of that. Just hold it right there. Hold it right there. Come on over here with me. Come on over here. Hold it right here. <laughs> Y'all thought you'd get up here easy, huh? Break it off for me. And then he goes on to say, whoever's willing to live, lose their life, will preserve it. And he said, where the vultures have gathered, there you'll find dead bodies. I'm going to take that scripture to mean this. If you're willing to go to another level with God, if you're willing to abandon everything, if you hear him saying, behold, I come quickly, if you hear him saying, I'm about to do something in America, and if you're not ready for it, I'm sorry. If you don't have Coram Deo, you're not going to make it. This fluffy Christianity stuff, this Easter Christmas Christianity has got to end. This show up when I feel like it, as long as we don't have soccer practice, has got to end. Put right, right, right back here, right here. And I came here and I wrestled with this since about 6 a.m. this morning, which I'm an evangelist and I do not believe in early mornings. And so you have to understand. Holy Spirit woke me up and said, felt like I was going a whole different direction. And Holy Spirit woke me up this morning and said, you tell them. She was on the verge of getting free. She was so close to her breakthrough. But she looked back. And God is saying across this house, enough. Enough. There's some grandparents in this place that have been so, I want every, I'm going to do something peculiar. 
I want every grandparent. All right, let's just, I'm a grandfather, 52 years old. Two grandsons. Every grandparent that has been grieved beyond belief lately with what you're watching happening in America, just raise your hand. So, at this age, it's not just about getting our coffee for free. AARP sent me something. I tore that thing up. I may have burned it. How dare you? This is your now. Shut your eyes and lift your hands across this place. Simple altar call. It's building for the prophetic word that we're released over this house tonight and over your life. It's building towards what God is about to do in this place. He told me you come and lay the foundation this morning. But Lord, I'm ready for Holy Spirit breakout. He said, you are building a foundation for what I do tonight and tomorrow night. And the reason why God sent me to preach this message here is he's saying, will you let go of those things, even though like Lot's wife, we're saying, don't ask me for that. Will you let go of the things that have held you back? Will you let go of the fears? Will you let go of the opinions? Will you let go of yesterday's hurts? Will you get on the roof and will you come to another level? And God is saying, I know you're telling me, don't ask me for that. So with your eyes shut, say this, everybody in the house, even if you're not a believer, say, God. What do you want? He's asking you for something. Cry out to him across this place without any music. Begin to cry out to God. He's saying, are you ready? The water is running. The scratching at the door, just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be days of, and it was it was in the days of Lot. So it will be in the, in the so as it will be in the days that Son of Man comes, there will be buying and eating. Remember, Lot's wife. What is he asking you for, Church? I tell you what he's asking me for. He's asking me to be wherever he's pouring out his spirit. To no longer be comfortable. That's what he's telling me over and over and over and over, which he knows I don't like because I like structure. So here's your altar call. Look at me for a second. Put your hands down. What you, just one more time. This is going to take some guts. One last time. Now flow. All over this house, if you're desperate for God and you don't care what nobody thinks, if you're willing to abandon everything, I mean everything. He this side over here we're going to say that's where we're going to leave the dead things of our life the things that don't matter anymore but up here we're having an altar experience and if you say well you know I, i'm really concerned because i'm auto, i'm immune uh can't handle COVID or anything like that then you get these first two rows you can stay in your perimeter because i respect that but everybody that's desperate i'm looking for one person not these ones that are holding this i need y'all to hold it because, you know, if you, if you go past this line in a crime scene, you're going to get arrested. So I ain't coming back there to y'all. I don't want to get arrested. My family history has a lot of that. But I'm looking for one person that says, I will leave everything and follow him. I will abandon everything to go to the next level. I'm looking for one person that is desperate 
enough that will come and break through this line. Break through the line. Go, through it, go around. Break through it. Yeah. 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 Yeah, here it comes. Here they come. Here it comes. Here it comes. Here it comes. Because you're saying, I'm done. Pat, I'm done. Pat, I'm done. 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 Come on. I'm looking for some mamas and some dads to come in this place and say, I am done with who we used to be. I'm done with the way I've been thinking for the last two years. I'm done with the mindset that have controlled me. Come on. All down. Come on. Come down here and join me. Holy Spirit is about to move across this room. And if you say, somebody shout, I'm done. Because I can't go back to the way I used to be. I need you, Lord, more than ever before. I can't go back to the way I used to be. I need you, Lord. Somebody start crying out to him now. You're down here. You know what he's asking you for? Oh, I can't go back to the way I used to be. I need you, Lord, more than ever before. Because where you lead me, I will follow. Where you lead me, I will follow. I can't go back to the way I used to be. I need you more, more than yesterday. I need you, Lord. More than words can say, I need you more than ever before. I need you, Lord. I need you, Lord. Got to give an altar experience here, but I'm getting kind of caught up in his presence. Something special about this house. Something very, very special about Word of Life. Pastor, you said it not knowing what I was going to preach on. You talked about the new wineskin. I can't put, I can't put fresh wine in old wineskins. You know why? Because it's dry rotted. It's cracked. It's leaking. You're leaking all over everybody. I need you, Lord, more than the air that I breathe. I need you, Lord. Lord, I want to see. I need you, Lord. Every eye shut across this place. God is saying, I need you to let go of everything that's held you back. This is consecration moment. This is Coram Deo moment. This is morning where it goes from my head to my heart to eventually I'm at his feet where I'll serve him. But all over this room with your eyes shut, if you say, Pat, I've got to get my life cleaned out. I need a total turnaround, a total shifting. I keep going back down into the house to the old things, and I do not want to be left out of this next move of God. When he comes, I want to be ready, and I'm tired of looking back. And if you say, Pat, I need God to cleanse me, wash me, and forgive me, lift both your hands if you physically can because I hear this I hear it no music say Jesus say Jesus I'm on the roof and I miss the things down in the house Come on, you didn't say that right. 
I miss the things out in the house. Now, I don't know why, man, I'm having to keep saying this because you know what's in the bottom of your house that God keeps, you keep going back and trying to fix. You're trying to fix something you can't fix, only God can fix it. So say, God, I miss the things in the house. But I know on the roof, I'm ready for you to do something in me. I will not look back. So in Jesus' name, forgive me for continually going back. I repent. I am focused on you. You the Christ, the one true God. I can't look back. Help me not to look back. I'm pressing forward. I forgive what's back there. Second part. Say, Jesus. Restore my soul. Here he comes. Here he comes. He's just going to begin to just wave over you right now. From the front to the back to online. I can't go back to the place I used to live. I can't go back. Can't go back. I'm pressing on for the life I have been called. I can't go back. I'm pressing on. I need you, Lord, more than any other thing. I need you, Lord. I need you, Lord. Lift your hands. Say this. Restore my soul to the place of hunger. Restore my soul to the place of hunger. To the place of hunger. Restore my soul. Man, I see prodigals coming home. They want to see, Mama, where are you at? I'm on the roof, baby. Come up here. Where you at, Grandfather? I'm on the roof, baby. Come up here. Where you at, Auntie? I'm on the roof, sweetheart. Come up here and experience what God's about to do. Somebody say, I can't go back. Oh, I can't go back to the place, to the place I used to live. I can't go back. The song is, I made up, God put my heart. I can't go back. There's something supposed to break out in here. But every time God starts to move in this church, soft, every time God starts to move in this church, a spirit of lethargy comes back. And the very ones that were being counted on to be a part of it, go back. And you are going to get to heaven. Look at me. I don't want you. I'm telling you the truth. I'm, I'm just listening to the Holy Ghost. I don't want you to get to heaven and for God to come up and say, you are good. Thank you for loving me. But this is what I wanted to give you. I wanted to let you be a part of the greatest experience you've ever known. And I didn't want you to wait to get to heaven to experience it. Because I will invade earth with my glory, he says. So who is willing to say, and I'm not just talking about coming tonight, tomorrow, I'm not talking about any of that. But who is willing to say, I want the old man to die. Come on, say it out loud. I want the old man to die. Say, God, consecrate my heart. Consecrate my eyes, my feet. So lift your hands and say, I can't go back to the place where I used to live. To the place I used to live. I can't go back. I can't go back. I'm pressing on. To the prize he's promised me, I'm pressing on, I'm pressing on. Come on, moms and dads. I can't go back 
to the place we used to be. I can't go back. I can't go back. Now lift your hands, and here's what God's going to do to close this. If you physically can, he's going to begin to heal your body as you begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. You say, I don't do that. Why not? It's like going into battle without a weapon. Oh, that's not for today. Really? Have you read Acts 19? It happened in Ephesus 20 years after Pentecost. It's a gift to be able to do warfare with. When my wife had a fever of 102 for 10 days from COVID, and I said, God, I don't want to lose her, and Karen's lips were turning blue, he said, go to your prayer room and pray for one hour in tongues and don't say a word. I went up there for one hour, prayed in the Holy Ghost. When I came down, she's sitting up in the bed, soaking wet, fever broke. That's a true story. So you go ahead and be some halfway Christian that picks up a few of the gifts. And you can live in your Romans 12, gifts of grace, which are awesome. Gift of giving, gifts of hospitality, all those amazing gifts. But I don't just want one set of gifts. I want the gifts of the Holy Ghost too. I want to get the faith in 1 Corinthians 12, 9. I want to be able to walk in both. And you better make up your mind. So all over this house, if you're not filled with the Holy Ghost, ask Him to fill you. He'll fill you right now. Lift your hands. Say, fill me with the Holy Ghost. I know I'm getting ahead of the services here, but I got to do this. Begin to pray in the Holy Ghost right now. It's going to come out of you. He's going to put, it'll be like crust breaking off your windpipe, breaking off your vocal cords. As you begin to pray in the Spirit, oil will start watering those vocal cords in Jesus' name. Begin to pray in the Spirit. You're going to begin to pray in the Spirit and you're renouncing things from yesterday. Oh, I can't go back. I can't go back. Somebody help me. I can't go back to the place I used to be. I can't go back. I can't go back. Oh, I can't go back to the place I used to be. I can't go back. I can't go back. Say, I'm pressing on. I'm pressing on to the high call. To the high call that's for me. I'm pressing. This time when he does it, when Chris does it with me, and you have been fantastic. Do it again. Shut your eyes. When he does it, ready? When he, when he does it, shut your eyes. And he's going to tell you the augmented note of some things you've got to change in your home starting today. Louder. Louder. If you will step into the destiny that God has for you and your family, for you and your babies, for you and your business, for you and your ministry, you will begin to live into a place where you can say, I can't go back to the place I used to be. I can't go back. God's restoring your testimony. Spirit of prophecy tonight, oh, i got to be careful, I'm getting ahead of myself, is the testimony of Christ. So people don't realize, if it doesn't point to Christ, it ain't from Him. It's witchcraft. So let's sing it one more time as we wrap up. You ready? I can't go back. Lift your hands. To the place. To the place I used to be. I can't go back. Tell them out louder, I can't go back. I can't go back. I can't go back. It's an anthem of the day. To the place I used to be. I can't go back. I can't. I can't go back. Sing it louder. You need to say it. I can't go back. To the place I used to be. I can't go back. Jesus is all I need. I can't go back. To the place I used to be, I can't go back. I can't go back. Now 
say it louder. I'm pressing on. I'm pressing on to the prize that's for me. To the prize that is for me. I'm pressing on. Pressing on. I'm pressing on. I'm going to say this. I hate it personally. Well, God will have there who he wants there. Yeah, okay. Softer. I got to have to make a point. When I hear people say, well, the Lord had who he wanted there. Really? No. Because if God had who he wanted here tonight, they'd be all the way out into the freeway. So we, brought, we should change it up a little bit and say it like this. God had who was there who was obedient, obedient to come. Bring your family, bring your friends. I'm preaching on the prophetic. I've learned that one prophetic word can shift a destiny. I can't even tell you how many times prophecy has been spoken that kept me from stepping on a landmine. Oh, you don't believe in that? Well, just look at Paul, book of Acts. Started to go one place, came to another place, and because he made the right decisions, we have the birthing of a movement. So what I'm saying is tonight, I believe God's going to unroll a scroll over your life. Now, she doesn't quite know it yet, but I've asked my wife to preach on breakthrough with me tomorrow night. Well, she kind of knows it, so that's not quite true. But she's been where she's preached in Pennsylvania and saw thousands running to the altar. Craziest move of God I've seen in a while. And so she's fine in this afternoon. But if you really mean you can't go back, I'm going to get you out of here in just a moment after pastor comes. Who feels... Okay, let's be honest. This is the difference in showing up at service and staying at home and watching on the internet, which sometimes you have to. I get it. But when you're here, you're under the wind of what God's doing. So who felt hope rise up in your spirit? I'm like, man. I mean, really, you feel like, wow, I feel like, come on, be honest. I mean, you just, almost like, almost like fresh air. So let's say it one more time. I can't go back. To the way I used to be, I can't go back. I can't go back. I'm pressing on. I'm pressing on to the prize that's for me. To the prize that is for me. I'm pressing on. I'm pressing on. Somebody shout, I can't go back. I can't go 